We've got a full house. We've got a fantastic speaker, so let's go. My name's Tom Ehrlich, and it's going to be my great uh, pleasure to introduce Jim Campbell. He is an academic force of nature. He's the Edgar E. Robinson Professor in the United States History, a prize-winning historian. Here's one of his books right here uh, for his work on African American history and culture from slave days to current days, a wide swath of a field that he teaches and writes about with great gusto through multiple lenses. He's an expert on the ways that Africa and America have been tied together, not just in history, but all the human misery of slavery, all the human dignity and disgrace of those who know about whom he has written. He's a renowned storyteller. Uh, stories are what interests him in his work, and that gives him a good excuse to include just about everything, every shape, every form of material in his courses, historic sites, museums, movies, just to name a few. Uh, Jim takes himself, I know, firsthand with great good humor, and he brings that humor to his exchanges with everyone, students, faculty, staff alike but he does take his responsibilities as a teacher with great seriousness. To cite just one example, students have, Jim has brought his students uh, in his residence to an incredible array of uh, cultural events, plays, operas, concerts, much, much more, and he's done so with the aim of ensuring they gain a rich exposure to the humanities in all its forms. I'm not alone in concern uh, that the humanities seem to be in trouble these days, these high-tech days at Stanford, but Jim is a larger-than-life exemplar of their importance, and I'm hardly alone in thinking so. When the Freshman Reflections program uh, was restarted this past winter, I knew I needed a faculty partner who could enlist faculty facilitators and it took less than a nanosecond, to use a high-tech term, uh, for those of us involved to agree that Jim was our first, our second, our third, our only choice. And we were right because he knows faculty in every field and it's just about impossible to say no to Jim. So with great pleasure, I say yes to Jim. We're eager to hear you talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's um, more than generous. Uh, you know, you agree to do these talks. They always ask you far in the future or far in the past, <laughs> whether you have a kind of reassuringly long period of time. Um, so they tell you you've got to do this. You say, sure, uh, maybe May. They then come back to you, you know, a few months later, and they say, we need a title, and so you gin one up. And then there comes a time where you look at your calendar and you say, holy crap. Um, and you wish you had chosen a different topic or maybe begged off entirely. Um, don't get me wrong. I am, in fact, very interested in trying to understand the value of disciplines, and in particular of my own discipline of history in the present historical moment. But as I've worked on this talk, I've realized that the disciplinary and interdisciplinary issue highlighted in my title is actually just one aspect of a broader and much messier set of questions that I want to talk about. A veritable conjurie of tensions and trade-offs that seem to surface in every campus conversation. I'm thinking here of the distinction between knowledge and skills, or capacities as we often call them nowadays, between theory and practice, thinking and doing, between humanities and the so-called STEM fields, or what our students, and forgive me for even invoking these terms, sometimes call the fuzzy and techy fields. Those bodies of practice and knowledge that appear to exist, for them at least, as somehow uh, existing for their own sake, versus those that somehow offer you something practical or concrete. All these distinctions are bandied about a lot at Stanford nowadays, 
They are routinely conflated. They are also, in my opinion, all universally overdrawn and with distinctly destructive results. Spend a bit of time in the Stanford Dining Hall and I promise you, you will soon hear one student disparage another student's choice of major by asking the question, what are you going to do with that? All of which is to say uh, that I'm going to, in this talk, open um, a can of worms, or I guess to keep my conjury metaphor, a can of eels, without much promise of actually saying anything concluding or conclusive about them. Um, but beyond that concern, there is something about the idea of trying to explain why I think history is valuable that rubs me the wrong way. Disciplines, after all, are not simply bodies of knowledge, nor are they simply sets of skills and capacities. Certainly they are both of those things, and reciprocally so, but they are also crafts, which is to say that they are not just about what we learn or do, but about who we are. Identities integral to the very ways in which we see, hear, and touch our worlds. It's kind of a stupid story, but when I was the age of the undergraduates I teach now, I spent several months in a rural hamlet in North Carolina. I was essentially running away from college. And while there, I uh, kept company with an old man who was a cabinet maker. It's quite an extraordinary man. His name was John Williams. Uh, he I don't think he had a sixth grade education. His workshop was totally made of reclaimed junk. Literally nothing had been purchased. Uh, and yet he'd become quite a celebrated craftsman. In fact, he by that time had been discovered and so lots of people in Hollywood and the entertainment industry were in fact having him make furniture. I'm not making this part up. He was making a bed for Tom Jones. And I'm not talking about Tom Jones in his 70s. I'm talking about Tom Jones in the 1970s, which is to say, I remember thinking, he's better be good. In any event, um, one of the things he used to do as he would talk, I remember he was making a table one day, and he takes a hunk of wood, also that he had rescued as, um, from a bog, and he was uh, turning a table leg on a lathe. And as he's talking to me, turning this lathe, he never once used a measure. Just would occasionally rub his hand over it, use a chisel, grab a different chisel, and so forth and so on. And when he finished that, he said to me, he was a very funny guy, he said, you know, there's never been a man born cannot turn a table leg on a lathe. He then said, the problem is turning three more look just like it. <laughs> <laughs> and that struck me at the time as, as good an explanation of what we try to do when we train students in graduate school in disciplines as any that I could ever come up with. When you immerse yourself in a discipline, you learn to run your hands across the grain of the world. And if you are attentive to that process, you will discern something of that world's grain and substance. So with that rather windy introduction in place, what I'd like to do is to run a historian's hand over this time and place to offer a few observations about the experience of living in Silicon Valley in the early years of the 21st century and to suggest some of the ways that that context shapes our predicament here as teachers at Stanford University. Please be forewarned that I'm not actually going to say much about teaching. But if nothing else, I hope to set some historical contexts that may enrich future conversations on that subject. But let me start with this. There's a term from my title that I haven't yet used, Google Glass. Let me show you this. Well, actually, let me set this up, set up the clip, as they would say on Johnny Carson. Uh, this was actually a commercial that I remembered seeing a few years ago. And I was kind of perplexed because it was like a proto Google Glass commercial. I thought maybe they were just trying to tease us with what they were working on. I remembered it involved a man sitting on a square outside Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral. So in preparing this talk, I thought I should go find it, which is to say I Googled it. Um, and when I failed, I did what any person of my age would do. I asked my college-age daughter to find it for me on Google, and she did. 
And um, it was interesting to discover how much of it I misremembered. This commercial aired not four years ago, but 14 years ago, in early 2000. You had to be a certain age, you'd routinely drop decades. The set, the, yeah, some people know what I'm talking about. The setting wasn't Paris, but Venice, outside St. Mark's, in fact. And the company that aired the ad was not, in fact, Google, but IBM. Let me show you the clip. Uh, give me soybeans. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, scroll up. Buy it! Buy it! Next page. Close that, close that. All right, beautiful. Sell! Sell! Sell it! All right, highlight four. Scroll up. Up, up, up. The voice activated wearable computer. Buy it! Buy it! Buy it! You're a baby. It may be far out. Uh, hi, Donna. Oh, yeah, the meeting was fine. But it's not far off. I'll be on the afternoon flight. Well, let's start there. Let's run a historian's hand over what we've just watched. Well, obviously, the first question a historian would ask, what we always ask is, when was this produced? And here, I think, the answer is revealing. This was, again, early 2000, which is to say just before the dot-com dot -com bubble burst. The first one, not the one we're living through right now. You can recover some of the, the character, the quality of that moment through the frenetic trading. And in this case, it was quite interesting, um, trading at once of abstractions, he's trading futures, but of physical items, products, grain futures, and in fact, pork bellies. Now, if you're a historian, you probably be, would be interested to know that this practice was actually invented in the United States specifically at the Chicago Board of Trade in the decades after the Civil War. Beyond that, and so redolent both of the 19th century Gilded Age and of our own, is the elevation in the commercial of money getting into a holy calling. The promise of technology here is not to build community, but as an engine of personal gain. Um, there's other things going on in this thing, too. I don't know if you had the same feeling that I did, but I found it more than a little dystopic. Um, and one sees here the kind of clear, stylistic, and aesthetic imprint of the 1990s cyberpunk movement. And that cyberpunk, I mean, it, I'm not sure that students today remember this, um, but what was really interesting about cyberpunk and the kind of offshoots, I'm thinking of novels like Neuromancer, the Terminator movies from a slightly earlier period, the Blade Runner movies, a host of uh, such texts. Uh, what all of them were grappling with and what we see here was trying to think through the implications of a profound change in the nature of the human machine interface. This is actually a problem with a long historical tale in Western thought. But it became particularly pointed in the late, 19, late 20th and early 21st century. And what you see here, in the first instance, is the promise of a hands-free device. Um, it is a signal fact, although an often unremarked one, that for the first generation or two of the digital revolution, the template we've used for the machine-human interaction is in fact a 19th century invention. It's the typewriter. And I think people in the future, maybe some people already today, will look at that with wonderment. Um, probably in the sort of same way that we look with wonderment at people who once used styluses to chip cuneiform tablets in ancient Sumer. Being required to meet, to have your interaction with the machine and with the wider world of the web inside it through your fingers not only limits you to 40 or 60 or 80 words a minute, it also occupies your hands when you can be doing other things, although he's not doing much there, feeding pigeons. Of course, here what we see is this new technology is now mediated not by hands, but by voice and eye movements. And there's, of course, a promise today to have no external mediation at all, an interface that is organic. And in fact, 
We already have that in some cases. That work is being done on this campus as we speak. Now, not surprisingly, different people have different responses to all this. Swimming as we are in the waters of Silicon Valley, there are some among us who will see the redemptive possibilities of this technology, which promises quite literally to do the work of Jesus, to enable the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the halt and the lame to pick up their pallets and walk. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and to be, ve to be young was very heaven, wrote William Wordsworth, reflecting back on his youthful enthusiasm for the French Revolution. And I have little doubt that students living on this campus, looking back years from now, some at least, will express similar sentiments. But of course there are darker dystopian possibilities too. Wordsworth, it should be noted, wrote those words in 1805, after the promise of the revolution had descended into the terror and the tyranny of Bonapartism. I am no prophet, but it seems to me possible, it seems to me more than possible, that the revolution in which we are living today will issue in similar darkness producing vast new concentrations of unaccountable power, new forms of alienation, isolation, and regimentation, new expressions not of human freedom, but of tyranny. Maybe. I mean, I could go on in this vein, but let me briefly underscore two points I've already made. The first is simply to note that the future portended in this commercial isn't just coming, as they tell us, it's here. Google Glass is today an actual product. There's actually an item in the paper yesterday about a person wearing them in a bar in San Francisco who got beat up. And I have to tell you, I had kind of mixed feelings about that. Um, <laughs> you can buy a pair today. And yes, you can use them to trade stock or talk to friends. You can use them to buy a plane ticket or take a photo to get directions, even to work on your golf swing. Not surprisingly, the folks at Google are at pains to emphasize the utopian rather than the dystopian possibilities of their invention. The promise not of isolating us from the world, but rather of enriching our engagement with it. I'm particularly interested in what Google calls the field trip function, which offers, in their words, an insider's guide to history, design, architecture, and more. Field trip, they explain, in the somewhat frothy rhetoric characteristic of their industry. Um, field trip channels the best of hundreds of hyper-local experts and trend-setting publications to help reveal the hidden gems around you. The second point I'd like to make, again, or simply to underscore, since I've really already made it, is that this promised future is not here simply in the temporal sense, it's here spatially. We cannot know what this future will look like, but we can be pretty certain that its contours will be shaped in many ways, perhaps even determined, by things that are happening right now on this campus. It's an obvious enough point, but it bears repeating. Stanford is the engine and the epicenter of the digital revolution. It is in a more than metaphorical sense both progenitor and product of the great transformation through which we are living. Now living in this particular historical context in this space and time presents those of us who teach here with unique possibilities and also with more than our share of perplexities and challenges. Challenges, I think as Tom suggested, that bear particularly heavily on those of us working within the so-called traditional humanities disciplines. To put it in the vernacular of students, why bother to study something like history or architecture when you can simply activate a device with your voice or with eye movements and find out all you need to know about the building in front of you or the historical events in which you're interested about cruciform writing or the construction 
of St. Mark's Cathedral. I mean, to push the point even further, why bother to study this kind of stuff when you can build the application and make bucket loads of money? Now, I'm putting this matter in rather vulgar terms, but it seems to me that these are the questions which we at Stanford today are grappling with. There is a conversation on this campus unfolding in many different places, in many different vernaculars. I'm thinking, obviously, about ongoing changes in the distribution of enrollments and majors and the various initiatives, suggestions, plans, proposals, and hand-wringing to which those changes give rise. I'm thinking here not only about the continuing decline in traditional humanities fields, but also about the movement of students into interdisciplinary programs, which seem, I think, to many of them to promise something more practical, more applicable. It is a fact, I think, that Stanford today, about 40%, slightly more than 40% of our undergraduates graduate with a degree in an IDP. But I'm also thinking about the abortive proposal for a Stanford and New York campus, as well as the more recent approval of a quarter-long Stanford and New York program to focus on arts and culture. I'm thinking about last week's faculty senate approval of the CS Plus initiative, under which students will be allowed to complete dual majors in computer science and one of 10 humanities disciplines. I'm also thinking even more recently, this is just this week, of the unveiling of the Stanford 2025 project. I don't know if any of you went to see it. An initiative spawned by Stanford's design school, the D School, with a goal of re-envisioning the nature and structure of undergraduate education at this university. I'm particularly interested in the 2025 initiative because of the way in which it cites as one of its inspirations the 2012 report of the study of undergraduate education at Stanford, or SUS, of which I was one of the authors. In all these places and scores more, we on this campus are struggling to understand the implications of the broad technological, political, economic, cultural, social, and intellectual changes of which Google Glass is such a vivid harbinger. Not to be over dramatic about it, we are grappling with the future of the university, the future of the humanities, and the future of academic disciplines. Now, I certainly don't have time to offer my own answer to all of these conundrums. Um, even if I had an answer, uh, or even if I had time, I'm not certain that I could. One of the things I've realized in ginning up this talk is that my own feelings about these questions are deeply confused and conflicted. And that my opinions seem to shift quite dramatically depending on who I'm talking with. <laughs> on the one hand, I've quickly become frustrated, not to use a stronger term, by all those who are ready to declare, again, the quote-unquote traditional university dead and gone. There are elements of this in the 2025 initiative. I don't want to be waspish here. I found that initiative and the discussions that led up to it, some of which I participated in, to be immensely creative and thought-provoking. But I'm also uneasy with some of the kind of assumptions or aspects of some of the vision of the project, including both the dismissal or at least demotion of traditional disciplines, as well as the neglect of what I would regard as the university's essential conservatism. Our role not simply as producers of new knowledge, but as conservators and expositors of existing knowledge. As a repository of the riotous wealth of human experience and creation in a word of history. Perhaps it's inevitable in a design group dedicated, and indeed in this case charged, to promote innovation. But I was unsettled by the claim, for example, that here, quote, the fundamental structure of higher education has not changed more than incrementally in the 900 years since the establishment of universities in Bologna, Paris, and Oxford. 
Well, first of all, I don't believe that claim is true. Yet what also troubles me is the kind of unquestioned anti-conservative assumption that animates it. That if something is 900 years old, it is obviously ripe for innovation. Or to use the term of the day, disruption. Now I don't mean to suggest that just because something is 900 years old, it's a reason to keep it. But I don't think it's a reason to toss it away either. Indeed, one might equally, with equal validity, hew to the opposite assumption. That if people have been doing something in certain ways for a very long time, that there may actually be some substantial reason for that, beyond the fact of mere inertia. And that we would do well to understand what those reasons are before consigning such institutions or practices to the rubbish heap. Now, I am certainly being unfair here to the Stanford 2025 folk, picking out one little quotation out of context. But there are lots of examples that I could cite to similar ends of conversations on this campus. The elevation of skills and capacities over knowledge. And I must concede here that one of the main texts that did that is the Seuss Report, of which I was one of the authors. With it, the enthusiasm for MOOCs, the idea that somehow most of what we convey in our classes can equally easily be put up on the web and sent to people for free. So why in the world, how in the world can we justify charging them money to come here? The relentless emphasis on practicality, on application, I don't disagree with this, actually. I don't disagree with the fact that we are training people to actually walk, walk out into the wider world and that um, we want them to be able to apply the knowledge and skills that they develop here to address challenges that face them in the wider world. But I am uneasy with this continue, almost an air of defensiveness as we feel compelled to push our students out into what we call, quite revealingly, the real world. As if what we do here is some kind of unreal self-indulgence. Again, there's a certain kind of defensiveness here. Yes, we're smart. Yes, we read books. We cultivate knowledge. But we're practical too. Indeed, the knowledge we produce is what's going to solve your problem. And in fact, this was the slogan of Stanford's recently completed campaign. Stanford solves society's problems, which of course issued in five new massive institutes on our campus, focusing on, see if I can get them, on uh, education, foreign affairs, the environment, and health. A fifth one was added last for arts, SICA, the Stanford Institute for the Creative Arts. Um, but it fit rather uneasily in the campaign rhetoric. In fact, I remember seeing, watching a football game and seeing Stanford, you know, the little commercials that universities put on. And this one was, was highlighting Stanford as a place for students to come and do and make art. And so it showed Stanford students dancing and painting and putting on plays and all of these things, quite beautiful. But the concluding message was, this is a quotation, we need the arts because arts provides new perspectives for solving society's problems. And I immediately wanted to stand up and shout, no, it doesn't. I wanted to quote another favorite poem, or poet, W.H. Auden. Poetry does nothing. It survives in the valley of its own saying. One might equally say the same of music, of dance, of rock painting. And these, too, are part of our essential responsibilities as conservators, as teachers, as learners at universities. So yeah, I can get pretty cross with people who are telling me that the great transformation is coming, that most of what we do is obsolete and good thing too. But as I say this, I must say I get even crosser with my colleagues in the humanities fields. 
a minority of whom, but I think a significant minority, engage in what might be described, depending on one's degree of sympathy, with either principled defense of their enterprise or flagrant denial of the world around them. We encountered this a lot on the Seuss Committee. One of the things that we did was we visited, I think, over 25 different departments and IDPs to talk to the faculty. And rather to my surprise, some of the most dispiriting conversations we had, in my opinion, were with my colleagues in humanities fields, several of whom suggested that declining enrollments betokened no need on their part to think about what or how they taught, but were in fact a reflection of someone else's failure of the admissions office's failure to bring in the right students, of the administration's failure to communicate powerfully its commitment to humanities, or worst of all, of the students themselves. Here are some of the quotes from my notes that I took during the Seuss Committee. I'm tired of teaching at a vocational school. All they want is to make money. They're not just not intellectual, they are anti-intellectual. And my favorite, I can't be bothered to teach students like that. Well, those comments do not ring true of my exposure and experience with Stanford students. They also do not ring true of my encounters with faculty in the STEM fields who, I must say, I learned this in the Seuss Committee, get pretty pissed off at this conceit that a lot of humanities professors have that somehow we're the real university. I don't know, history, classics, philosophy, maybe English. And then there's a rest of these group of people over here like making robots, some sort of glorified shop teacher from high school, right? <laughs> You better believe our colleagues outside the humanities hear that and they have strong feelings about it. But beyond the fact that this attitude doesn't ring true of my experience of Stanford students or of my colleagues outside the humanities, it seems to me to suggest two signal failures. The first is a failure of historical thinking. If our students are not coming to our classes, we need to try to understand why. Now, there's no time here for a long explanation, but because part of what I'm trying to do in this talk is model historical thinking, let me offer at least a few shreds of suggestions. I mean, one is we are sending our students off into the worst labor market since the Great Depression. In fact, we may be guilty of an erroneous assumption. The glory days of the humanities, when humanities emerged as the kind of primary fields in which students at American universities studied, it's in fact a fairly narrow period in American history, and it is primarily something that happens during that post-war period of prosperity from 1945 to 1973, where you could go to a place like I did Yale, admit rate at that time was one in three, if you finished, and you almost had to even if you spent some of your time running away to North Carolina, um, there was a job waiting for you, and a job that you would keep for a time probably for a long time. The world we're sending students out into provokes a considerable degree more of uncertainty and anxiety. The tuition the first year I went to Yale was $5,200. Well, we are now charging students a quarter million dollars to come to a place like Stanford. Moreover, we are increasingly admitting to Stanford, not everybody pays this, we are admitting to Stanford large numbers of people who did not come out of the classes that historically enjoyed access to these kinds of institutions. International students who today constitute over 10% of the enrollment at Stanford, first generation college students who constitute about one in six or 16% of the students at Stanford. These are from families, people from families who don't have the kind of blithe assumption that if you get a Stanford degree, doesn't matter what it's in, don't worry, everything will be fine. 
They want something. They want some assurance for that quarter million dollars or whatever portion of it they're paying. Beyond this, there's a great change in American political culture in the generation, or now more than one generation, from the time I went to college to the time of students today. I don't want to romanticize who we were, but we spent an awful lot of time in angst-ridden conversations about our future, essentially debating whether we would do something f in the public interest or pursue private interest. Would we, to use the term we used all the time, sell out? Or would we do something useful? We have students now who have lived for the last 30 years or more in a society which has preached quite unapologetically that there is no distinction between the two. That the pursuit of private interest is itself a public good. That the essential arbiter of value is and ought to be a marketplace. Students living in that world aren't necessarily going to come here with the same set of values or assumptions that we did. And that's not their failing, that's ours. They didn't fashion that political world in which they have been nurtured. We did. To disparage them, to somehow withhold our empathy for them or our historical imagination of their predicament, our historical imagination about their predicament seems to me again a devastating failure particularly for humanities based scholars. The second failure it reflects I think basically, and this is really the last point that I want to make, is our failure to tell them why what we do is important. One of the things I learned through the Seuss Committee that I thought was quite interesting, and it's true th across the, the faculty in all fields, but has particularly deleterious consequences, it seems to me, in the context of the humanities, is most teachers here don't really communicate clearly, if at all, to students why they're teaching them what they teach. We, in fact, regard ourselves somehow as vehicles of content delivery. In fact, a lot of what we do in our classes probably could be replaced by online teaching. So I walk in and start prattling about Andrew Jackson, somebody else starts deriving an equation, fill in the blank. Right? And we somehow take it for granted that our students know why they're there, know what it is that we are trying to give them beyond the immediate content about Andrew Jackson, which, let's face it, they're going to forget. I mean, it always cracks me up, and I'm picking Jackson not at random because I lecture on him, you know? And every time I'll go in and give that lecture, I'll, like, watch these students, I'll write it down. You know, the Bank War, 1829. I think it was 1829 because I had to look it up on Wikipedia <laughs> before I gave the lecture. And I always have that moment of thinking, dude, you're not going to write that down. Right? Okay. But part of what I learned out of doing that Seuss project was actually, I think, to think a little bit more creatively about what I was doing, to recognize ultimately that that is the least of what we are doing, that what we are trying to do is to try to nurture in them ways of being, operating, seeing, touching the world. And what we want for them more than anything else is to help them find one that is beautiful and compelling to them. One of the things I say to students all the time, I mean, it has become a kind of mantra and they kind of chuckle when I say it because I get, probably do it two or three times in every lecture. But I try to explain to them why I think history is important. And it's not because it somehow offers us some tidy lesson. It's not because... Uh, Somehow, if you understand history, you will not repeat its mistakes. The opposite proposition seems more nearly the case to me. I tell them that we study history for the same reason that we travel. Because when you travel, you will encounter people, whether you travel in space or in time, whose universe of moral possibility substantially overlaps with yours and yet is not identical to it. And in the process of doing that, 
you learn at once about the range of human possibility and about the nature of human commonality. You then come back to your own society and you see it with fresh eyes, with your own set, if you will, of Google glasses, of things that had previously seemed obvious or natural to you, which can now emerge as somehow historically contingent, particular. And when you realize that the way the world is is not the only way that that world can be, you also begin to develop some sense of your own capacity to act in that world, to live creatively in that world, and to change that world. That's why we study history. That's the most precious thing that I can give people. And that is why I think it is a discipline, and I'm sure most disciplines would have similar things to contribute, to try to understand the world that we are living in right now. Thank you. We have a little time for questions, and I've been asked to repeat the questions because we're being immortalized. We're going to go on the web. <laughs> you see, you don't even need to come here. You could have just stayed home and watched. Please. You know, I, I mean, I think that um, one of the things that I have found, I mean, we, we did some transcript um, studies. Well, we actually availed ourselves of transcript studies that when we were on the SUS committee that were being done by the WASC accreditation committee. And they did some detailed transcript studies. And what they found was actually quite interesting. The narrative that humanities professors have that somehow, you know, we're surrounded by Philistines actually turns out not to be true that students in the STEM fields here attend Stanford University. Students who are humanities students attend a tiny corner of Stanford University and then figure out some way to, with as little effort as possible, satisfy a science or quantitative reasoning requirement. Um, so, you know, I guess that's the first thing. So one tries to attack this at the level of being an advisor. One tries to attack it as a teacher by recognizing that the people who walk into your class are not little mini-me's, right? They're not there because they aspire, God forbid, to be what you are, right? And that it, at a place like this, a very, very substantial number of students who walk in there, this may be the only history class they'll take. That's not something to lament. That's just a joyous opportunity, right? And so again, it's, it's moved my teaching. This whole experience has really moved my teaching in the way of being much more attentive to kind of metacognitive, you know, do much more pull back the man behind the curtain to explain why I'm doing what I'm doing and to try in some homely ways to communicate to students why I think um, this is useful in their lives, not just useful in the sense that it's giving them a set of skills and capacities that they'll use, but that it also will enlarge their humanity. But I just noticed one of the things that you've mentioned is seemingly worrisome was this idea of, of uh, pairing um, you know, the uh, science or engineering mm. uh, major with the humanities major. Yeah, let me, let me talk about that. I'm not a, I, I actually do not find that alarming, and, right. and there, I have some colleagues who do. So for those of you who aren't aware of this, uh, We've just, I think we're going to pilot two next year, but we have recently, Stanford has recently uh, launched a thing called the CS Plus Initiative. Let me give you a little bit of background on it because it's pretty instructive. Um, this idea germinated in the computer science department. And it germinated in the computer science department because they have too many students. Now, I am of the opinion that the reason they have too many students is not because all of our students, you know, want to be that guy and be billionaires. They sat down some number of years ago and redesigned their curriculum focusing in particular on entry-level courses. And they did so brilliantly. I'm a, I am a um, ref, a, a resident fellow in a sophomore dorm. And I'm always talking to kids about their majors. And the liveliest intellectuals that I find 
are computer science majors, many of whom didn't come to be computer science majors, but were overwhelmed by the beauty of what they were exposed to, not as a kind of vocational skill like shop class, but as thinking about thinking. They did this very well. So they have two courses, right? They have a thing called CS105 and CS106. 105 is the one I would have taken in my day, which is, you know, this is a, like, ask my daughter to find the thing on Google and this is where you put the plug in. <laughs> 106 is the gateway to the major. It is an extremely robust programming course. How many students last year took 106? Okay, now, we have about 1,650 kids per year coming through, so 100% um, coverage would be 1,650 a year. Pick a number out of your head. 1,760. <laughs> More than everybody. <laughs> okay. And and this has caused some consternation within the computer science department, right? Um, partly for a couple of reasons, and I think it actually reflects spectacularly well on them. They don't have the wherewithal to teach this many students. I don't think they have as many FTEs as the history department, but excise that piece <laughs> from the tape, right? But they also don't like what it portends. You know, the line, I should probably, probably shouldn't say this on tape either, but the line of the computer science department here has always been, if that's the education you want, go to Caltech, go to MIT. Stanford will give you more. We will give you a superb technical training inside the context of a fine liberal education. And they're worried that they're losing that, that their students are coming in and are specializing too early and that they're taking too many units in their major. So it was they who came to the humanities programs. And basically their idea was we will reduce the footprint of our major, we will direct students into your fields, we will um, allow them to count courses in your fields as electives in computer science. We will work with you to ensure that every student doing this dual degree will have a opportunity to produce a synthetic capstone combining the interests in these two programs. Our, in history, the requirement, well, not even requirement, the request, was to reduce our major footprint, which we reduced from 63 units for students in the general major to 59. So they're going to take one fewer history class potentially, right? Um, I don't actually, I'm not troubled by this at all. I think in fact what's extraordinary about it, I mean quite visionary, is the opportunity to actually give people robust training in two different disciplines and then to actually see what they make of it. And it's been kind of interesting watching the, you know, the conversation within the history part, department has been kind of interesting. Not just, you know, some, you know, not very much. I mean, we're quite enthusiastic, I think, in the main, but some grumbling about does this simply, you know, confirm our marginality? Are we compromising our own discipline sort of stuff like that? But one of the places where I think we don't quite get it yet is the idea of, okay, what are we going to do with them? And, oh, we'll have them, you know, work in the spatial history lab and so forth. They'll doubtless do that, but I think what's really exciting, they're going to do stuff we haven't even imagined yet. Right? And um, so, no, I'm actually, I'm not unnerved by that at all. I actually think that's uh, actually a pretty positive development. Of course, we'll have to see how it goes. And, you know, universities are far better at launching new initiatives than they are at sustaining them and making sure they work. So we'll see. Please. I, I like your metaphor about uh, history as a time travel. Uh, do you think it's a pipe dream to actually hope, assume, and, and maybe implement uh, technology in the service of arts, history, and so forth to, to enhance the, the range of travel or the, the sensitivity of the traveler? You know, again, it, uh, so much of this depends on well, the attitude with which one greets it. You know, one can, yeah, I think that that's happening, right? I mean, a guy sitting with Google glasses in St. Mark's Square can, you know, sh jump up and shriek and trade shares, but also can, I mean, this is literally the case now, can actually wear those glasses and learn something about when it was constructed, the nature of its construction, hypertext over to other cathedrals to see what's distinctive about it, you know, learn something about, you know, what's happening to 
rising sea levels in Venice. I mean, you just start thinking about it. I mean, you know, I, th I think that that's actually extraordinary. And, um, you know, I don't think that, that somehow we need to fear this or repudiate this or somehow regard this as a threat to what we do. I do, however, think, you know, that, that um, I don't know, that somehow the things that we offer students in traditional disciplines still matter and are still powerful. And that in, in some ways, I think, I mean, I, you know, I, I think what we're trying to do is to give them a set of Google Glasses, right? And I think every discipline does that. I mean, if we look out the window, right, I as a historian see certain things. And I am able not just to have information about certain things or understand the origins of certain things that I see out there, but I'm able to feel and to respond and to react to certain things because I imagine the world as a historian imagines it. If my training were in botany, in architecture, in the history of education, in any number of, in, you know, since that's the faculty club, in cuisine, there's any number of other things, right, that might activate for me, right? And, I, and again, what I say to students all the time, you know, is um, I don't care which one you do. Find one. Discipline your mind. Learn what it is to see and engage the world within the framework of a particular way of being. I don't care which one it is. Find the one that is beautiful and compelling to you. And as you do that, what then happens is you suddenly discover actually that there are other people who have different sets of glasses. And that's really cool, too. But I think that interdisciplinary discovery actually is most powerful, not when we front load it and just, you know, as we do and often, in just, you know, today we read a history book and then we're going to read a novel and tomorrow we're going to the zoo. But actually to train someone to understand what the stakes are of thinking in the, about the world in a disciplined way and then at that point to show them that there are multiple ways of understanding the world. You mentioned the overall of the computer science curriculum, and uh, I'm actually majoring in math, and it seems that in math the emphasis on undergraduate education seems to be much different and much lower than it is in the computer science department. Why do you think the CS department in particular has placed such an emphasis, and do you think there's the potential for other departments to follow their lead in improving the quality of their undergraduate education? I, you know, I don't know the answer. I don't know enough about any. I mean, I don't. I, I truly, and I'm not just being discreet. I don't actually know enough about it. I did actually go over to the computer science department to talk to them about it and to tour their building and to do a bunch of things like that. And um, I have a few thoughts. You know, one is some of the people teaching in that, I hate to say this, some of the people teaching there are um, their professors slash teaching, their professors parens teaching, right? And this is their passion and this is what they do. Um, there's also been an extraordinary uh, spatial reorganization of their building, right? If you go in that building, it's full of students who are interacting and working together and doing stuff, which is very different from the experience of if you walk into History Corner, for example. So we're, in fact, in the History Department trying to, I think, maybe learn a bit from that. Um, but, you know, I, uh, you know and, I, and, and I also don't, I mean, it, is, it certainly is also the case that, you know, students living in Silicon Valley at this moment, um, for reasons just environmental but also, you know, economic are going to be more likely to reach out to computer science or try, if they're going to think about what to do for their fourth class, to do that rather than a math class or something else. So you've, you've emphasized a lot the value of, of discipline and the disciplinary approaches to, to knowledge. And earlier in the talk, you, you referred to the growth of interdisciplinary majors as possibly an emblem of, of a troubling direction in, in yeah. Stanford education. And I'm wondering if you could say a little more about whether you think it's possible for students to maybe derive the same kinds of benefits from an interdisciplinary education, or maybe how those of us in interdisciplinary programs can, can somehow uh, provide to our students the same uh, benefits that, that you see as coming from the, the discipline? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, th that's, like I said, I'm confused and conflicted about a lot of these issues. I've spent, I have affiliations with interdisciplinary programs here now. I spent about half my career not actually in the history department, but in interdisciplinary American studies and African American studies programs. Um, 
So I, I don't mean to um, disparage what interdisciplinary programs do. I do, out of that experience, have certain kinds of concerns, right? And, and they're amplified at Stanford for one or two particular reasons. One is, again, just that, you know, the dangers of, interdis of premature interdisciplinarity, right? That it just becomes stuff, right? And we, I used to see this in American studies, you know, that... Um, Look, and I taught in it, right? But that, you know, they'd take a class on film, and they'd take an English class, and they'd take a religious studies class, and they would take my African-American history class. And the notion, I mean, it all sort of was about America, right? But the notion that there was any kind of systematic process for learning to be able to think and engage in a kind of rigorous or disciplined way just wasn't there. And I think that was a failure. Not, it's not inherent in interdisciplinary programs. I think it was a failure. Um, just of our curriculum, right? But the other thing I think that, that amplifies this problem a little bit at Stanford is we have these IDPs that are now t teaching almost most of our students, but we have here a system of hiring, of FTE allocation, in which IDPs have zero, right? And so I think one of the, one of the difficulties of building a kind of coherent interdisciplinary curriculum which would provide the kind of rigor and structure that we're looking for and would help students operate and think within the context of disciplines and then introduce them to the, the possibilities of interdisciplinary inquiry is you're always begging and borrowing your faculty, right? And so it's very hard to build any kind of coherent curriculum because you're just trying to figure out who can staff this course. And you're often reduced, often reduced, to um, hiring adjuncts or other people just, you know, who can step into a class. And so I, you know, um, so no, I, I again, I, you know, I, I don't mean to be disparaging of them. Maybe one more? Please. Just for history's sake, um, when I was a student here in the 60s, and uh, to really reinforce your point, about letting students decide where the world is going. Uh, as, a, as a graduate student in electrical engineering, before there was computer science, um, and Jean Clemmer was one of my lab mates. Um, wow. So that was context. Uh, one of the things that the professor said, you cannot do something in medicine and engineering. You have to decide in engineering. And my answer was, and it was working in a box, that you can't stop me from studying what I need to to take things future because it's so clear that engineering and medicine come together. So tell me what you have to do, what I have to do to get my degree, but you can't stop me. Uh -huh. And that's how bioengineering got created. Uh -huh. And so I think. What you are saying is very important that history tells that young people know where the world is going and we have to facilitate that rather than requiring them to meet our way of being. I don't know if that was helpful or not uh, for a history professor. No, no, I do. I mean, I... I history, I think. I mean, I certainly do. I certainly do feel this way. I mean, one of the things that I've learned from history is that every generation thinks that the next generation is going to hell in a handbasket, yeah. right? And we think it because they don't actually know or value the same things that we know or value. And um, you know, again, I think part of that's on us. Part of it is uh, we need the historical imagination to understand who they are and how their, the circumstances of their time have shaped them. We need to find them. And if there are things that we know and that we value that we think are vital to them, then it's incumbent on us to teach them why that's the case. And I actually think we can do that. Um, there's one more. Please. Sort of narrow mindset that is often produced and reproduced in humanities 
departments. I was wondering, do you think there is any connection between our graduate students with the game and the attitudes? You know, I'm increasingly alarmed by the fact that this is going to go up on the web. Uh, um, look, I, I think that, and, and, and you know, I don't, I don't, that, what I, that some of the quotations I gave are not emblematic of humanities faculties, faculty here as a whole. Absolutely not, right? Um, I'm blessed with extraordinary colleagues. And, um, but I, I do think that, I mean, I'm, Without sort of getting into the, the question of relative degrees of provincialism or what have you, I mean, part of what I learned being on a multidisciplinary faculty committee in SUS was that we all know about what we, what we know and we all don't know about what we don't know, right? I mean, one of the things that we did at the very outset, we did a couple of interesting kind of icebreaker exercises, but we gave everybody homework where they had to write, it would be a travesty if a person left Stanford without and he had to fill in five blanks. And then we collated the 16 of us. And I think we got like 25 pages, right? And what we realized was I didn't, I tragically didn't know 80% of what <laughs> some of these people here thought. And then others didn't. And, we, and this became a kind of joke to us, right? That every time we would have somebody in to speak, it would be hilarious. We had Gerhard Casper come in. And Gerhard was kind of conceding, well, you're right. There's no way we can have a core curriculum anymore. But for God's sakes, it is inconceivable to me that a person could get a college degree without having read The Tenth Federalist. And I saw about half of the eyes of my colleagues around the table go down, right? Carol and Luigi did the same thing with Locke's second treatise. Then somebody came in and started talking about the laws of thermodynamics, and then I'm fixing my pen, right? Um, so we're all provincial, right, in, in that sense, okay? And, um, and realizing that that didn't mean that these people were somehow, again, Philistines. That was really helpful to me. As for graduate training, I do believe you've put yourself on some, your finger on something really very important, right? That it is in the nature of different fields now that people who are doing PhDs in, let's say, electrical engineering or computer science or what have you, have a set of skills that are obviously and easily marketable. That's less obviously marketable for the training you get if you're getting your PhD in com comparative literature history. Actually, history is pretty good. You know, there's an awful lot of history produced and consumed uh, and created outside the academy. Um, so I think one of the things that we have heretofore not done particularly well in humanities fields is both alert our students along the way to the availability of these alternative ways, and as you point out, to valorize them. I mean, I don't know if you saw this, but the dean of, or the vice provost for graduate education did a series of focus groups with graduate students two years ago, asking precisely the set of questions. And what she found was that these PhD students, when she talked about, are you interested in alternative careers? Would you like to learn more about them and so forth? They emphatically said yes. And then they also said, but please don't tell my advisor. Because they had kind of somehow internalized that we would disapprove of them if they did that. And I think that is clearly a failing on our part. Thank you all so very much.